heaven I'm going mad. What a strange girl you are. Yeah, this is Anna and Allison. Allison, that's me. It's Can my name. you uh, tell us a little bit about Zoli Vera? You jump right into it like you want to sell shit. Look at you. Oh, is is that not what we're doing here? <laughs> no, we can do it here. So, um, well, I live in Maine. Anna lives in California. Yeah. We're very far away from each other. Um, she's 3,000 miles away from me, to be exact. Is that exact? It's about that, right? It's pretty exact. Pretty far. She's pretty far. Um, but with technology, we're just close as could be. We're two peas in a pod. Best friends. Yes. <laughs> She's shaking her head at me, but it's okay. Yeah. She thinks I she like her, but I don't know. She knows it's true. She's on the fence, but you know. It all started when? When? Because I opened a store, which now is not open, but I opened a store and I was looking on Etsy and I found this girl's stuff. And it was really cool because she makes awesome Victorian inspired toiletries. She sounds um, wonderful. Yeah, she she was cool. So I ordered some of this girl's stuff. We became friends, and mm-hmm. here we are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She was talking about me, if you didn't know. Yeah. Um, I was talking about Allison. So Anna was a client turned friend. Yeah. We immediately cl- well, I when she ordered soap products from me i um looked up her store and got really excited because you had all these graphics that i loved and it was really similar to stuff i did except you weren't ripping me off because it was perfume not soap. yeah so, so it was we a close call fast friends it we was. almost it, hated each other but then we could have you know, yeah, if you we were a bitch have. i probably would have hated you yeah but. yeah okay should i not well, swear since we're representing our companies no it's okay it's a small business all the swearing <laughs> it's just we're just sorry yes this is an 18 ourselves. and over podcast no it's not i want the kids to hear it <laughs> not suitable for work okay. just warning it's not nsfw yeah. um yeah so we were um we talked very professionally for maybe a week <clears throat> yeah and then and then it was like we found out weird stuff about each other. Like we were both in labor for 32 hours. And that's right. We had little girls that were about five days apart. And we're both makeup artists. And we both have companies that are super similar. And um, yeah. Yeah. So that was cool. Thanks for being my friend. Yeah. Oh, and then we also found out we have an interest in strange and beautiful things. Yeah. And that's. Uh that's the name of this podcast, isn't it? Oh, you didn't even realize. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, yeah, I always, I, I just personally love a lot of weird trivia type things. And I've always want like, you know, a lot of people have useless knowledge. Well, I have that, but all vintage stuff. Yeah, you do. You know, so I feel like I need an outlet for that because I tell people and they really don't care. Right. So... <laughs> But then usually but I you care. care. I you care. care. And you know what? Sometimes so, people care. Yeah. People out there might care. Whoever's going to listen to this probably cares. Sure. Sharing the so, knowledge. Yeah. Sharing it all. So why don't you uh, why don't you start this this edition one of Beautiful Strange with <sighs> your first fresh. topic. So fresh and so clean. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about some. <clears throat> I'm going to clear my throat and then we're going to talk about some topics so basically we'll have a few little stories in each episode that we have researched a little bit that have piqued our interests that we want to share with you and we'll just talk about it because we're friends and we like to talk about things so that's what we're here to do yeah we hope you like us you might not you still listen if you don't like us you might like what we're talking about right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I have some things I'd like to talk to you about. So the first one actually is um, on Facebook. You know how you can have a cover photo. Yeah. I have one of those. Do you have one of those? Mine oh. is. You don't? No. Yeah, I was saying. Oh, I didn't even oh, know you, you were going to no. draw. I didn't know you were going to draw like you know segue from from that. That was a good little segue. I see where you're going with this. Well, do you know what my cover photo is? Uh, 
for is, ZV is, or for your personal? No, for me. Okay, yeah. Okay, I know. I can. Th- I see it in my mind, but I actually don't know what it is. So that's cool that you're going to explain that. That's a really cool image, and it is called the Beauty Micrometer, and oh. it's also known as the Beauty Calibrator. So Max Factor mm-hmm. in the 30s. Well, he actually died in 1938, but he Max Factor Senior. Um, basically, it was he invented a company. Invented, founded. He founded a company where um, they really focused on film makeup, and not a lot of people mm. did that back then because yeah. there was Technicolor and all these different ways. I mean, still in film today, it's it's a very specific way that you do makeup, which as a makeup artist, I'm sure you have that knowledge. Mm. Um, but back then, you know, color was just really funky. It came out in a very funky way, so you had to do makeup. Re- like today there's HD, but you know, you can see everything, mm-hmm. but back then the color was always off. So film makeup artistry was weird and they had the grease paint. Do you know what grease paint is? Like no. Really, it's like really, or like pan stick foundation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It was just really heavy, cruddy stuff that they had to use, yeah. which is why cold cream exists actually. Like cake, like cake, I mean. like chrome yeah. cake and like, yeah. What? <laughs> okay. never mind. <laughs> I think it's a, I think I'm referencing a, a, major retailer type product which i won't mention don't mention the retailer we don't want to name names yeah um we might get sued they, they make something it, yeah. with the word like chrome and it's about like super heavy duty paint makeup but yeah oh i i know the brand mm-hmm. 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 yeah um so well i can explain that actually so um pancake well i actually don't know fully but there's like pancake makeup pan stick makeup and i think that's the same as grease paint so way back when, in I think it was Max Factor that actually started it, um, but grease paint was used, and that was basically um, pancake foundation and mascara, mm-hmm. which another major retailer makes nowadays. Yeah, we have their lipstick. Um, <laughs> it's the only company I know that makes it, but they it was basically powder because it was very yeah. easy for them to make, and then you would just mix either cream or. Water. water with it yeah so that you could put it on your face and you could make it very thick if you wanted to so it was great for movies because you needed a lot of coverage a lot of pigmentation all mm. that stuff so he was really the guy that all of it came about because of him because his company focused on film makeup and made that possible so they also invented a thing called the beauty micrometer and it was scary as shit <laughs> it looked really, really weird so it was described. This, yeah, this explains your photo. It does look super yes. creepy. And we yeah. will. So on our website, you guys, we have we'll have a blog and we'll make posts for each episode so that you can see what we're talking about. Because we might occasionally share videos and photos and yeah. not know what we're talking about. So if if you know you want to know, just go to our website and go to the blog. And you'll see. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So or on yeah, Instagram. Was, or on Instagram, you can find us wherever you want to find us. We'll be there. Yeah. We're not shy. I'm a little shy. Anyway. <laughs> I won't you be never shy know, anymore. though. You know what? I won't be shy anymore. Yeah, you never Don't be know. shy. Don't judge a book by its cover. Um, so, Anna, it yeah. was described as a clockwork orange style device. Have you seen Clockwork Orange? Read the book? Uh, yeah. You familiar? I have. Do you remember when I got LASIK surgery? Yeah. And I sent you that picture from a clockwork yeah. orange because I was fucking I terrified because they had to put eye clamps on me. Yeah. Um... That's what this device was described as, because it's kind of reminiscent of that. So if you guys have seen Clockwork Orange, you probably know what I mean. It's a good um, descriptive way of explaining it, for sure, because I yeah. think listeners would probably identify with that. <laughs> right. Yeah, it was It was also compared to Hellraiser. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. You can see that, yeah. Um, and then it was also in Modern Mechanics magazine in 1935. It was described as a contraption that looks like an instrument of torture. Um, so what did this do so basically their idea was um so when you see people's faces in person their imperfections it's okay you can get over them nothing too you know crooked nose whatever but their idea was on film those things are really prevalent like you can really pick up on them yeah and they'll screw up a whole scene if your face isn't perfect so people are doing really strange things like um Ooh, now I don't remember. It's either Martha Graham or Gloria Graham. I think it's called 
she's called Gloria Graham, she would put um, tissue under her lip to make her lips mm. look bigger. Mm -hmm. And in between scenes, she would have to like take out this nasty tissue yeah. because she like would have make out scenes with people and she would yeah. have to take it out because it would get all sloppy gross. But she would do that because the studios would say, you know, you need a, yeah. a plumpier pout. You need to be perfect. So yeah, so in the same realm of, you know, that which today it's not much better. But yeah, that's what's ironic about that, actually, because right. you, you hear so much about how the media is selling a false image of people but really mm -hmm. i mean that's was this the thing at the conception of hollywood i mean it was never really right. any different mm -hmm. yeah no it's it's so i mean this device was basically to measure your face in all these really intricate ways so it was actually get my notes here um so it had these flexible metal strips all over it you put it right on your face real close up there are pictures you can see and it looks like you'd probably have claustrophobia in there because it's yeah. a little there's just metal all over, all over your face yeah and there's screws that hold in all these strips so it's that's i think the hellraiser thing because it just looks yeah. like it's full of nails and stuff and it can make up to 325 adjustments on your face and come within the precision of one thousandth of an inch I don't like, even know what that means, but it was very close. Now, are we talking about, like, a literal permanent, like, cosmetic surgery? Or are we talking about, like... Oh, no. This is... It was a device to measure your face so they could see what was wrong with your face as like, intricately as possible. So you're so they saying, could like, fix it with makeup. for symmetry, basically. For symmetry, yeah. To see... So, you know, like, today, we have contouring, we have highlighting. It was basically a device that was used... So that you could see exactly where you need to contour and highlight. Yeah. You know? And it wasn't... So they wanted to use it for the film industry primarily. And then they wanted to basically to put it in salons all over the world. That's thinking crazy. Women would flock to this. And, oh, I can figure out my imperfections Did. and correct them so easily. Did it not take off? Like It didn't take off. And I think that's why people don't really know about it. Yeah. Um, because, you know, it's... It, I think, when was the last one made? They finished making it in 1932. And then um, it just kind of phased out. Max Factor Sr. died in 1938, which I actually, I wrote down how he died because it was so interesting. Oh, really? Let me just tell you. You have to share quick. that. That's a must. So his, yeah, I found this out and I was like, I have to tell Anna, which is why we have this podcast because yeah. we shit all the time. It's I just, just really an you. excuse for us to talk to each other. Cause of death, illness after fright. What? what? what do you mean? So, so a heart attack? I mean, well, no, he just he was. I don't. I don't know. Maybe we should do a whole. Whoops, sorry. Maybe we should do a whole <laughs> podcast about that. I had to get professional. Next That's to actually. I've never like once heard someone dying of fright. I mean, I know. I was like, what? Illness, illness what after fright. About? So let me read you. I wrote down. Maybe this he had paragraph. a stroke. Maybe, but it, wouldn't it say that? It didn't say that. Yeah. So it said he was, in 1938, traveling in Europe on business with his son, Davis. When a stopover in Paris, he received a note demanding money in exchange for his life. What? An attempt was made by the police using a decoy to capture the extortionist, but no one turned up at the agreed drop-off point to collect the money. Factor was so shaken by the threat that he returned to the behest. I love that word, behest. Behest. Of a local doctor in America, where upon arrival he took to his bed and later died. What? And later died? Come That's on. That's creepy so, and interesting, yeah. but isn't that we'll weird? Never really so, know, huh? Yeah. So anywho, it's, that part's not about the micrometer, but maybe that's why it was phased out around that time because it was it was finished in 1932, and then they started marketing the crap out of it, and then he died shortly after. Like there are pictures of him using it on famous actresses in 1935 that were. Used in a, they tried to put it in a lot of science magazines to basically tell women, like, scientifically, we can make you beautiful. Like, yeah. forget about all these creams. Like, we can That's actually cool. fix what's wrong with your face. Yeah. So it, I it get reminded a hold me of one a of lot. These. <laughs> well, there's only one left in the whole world, Anna. And really? It is at, it's near you, actually. Is it's it? in the Hollywood Entertainment Museum. We should oh, go on a field trip. We should go there. For business, we have to do it. Yeah. We'll write it off. Yeah. Um, it also it it. went up for auction in 2009, falling oh. significantly short of the $10,000 to $20,000 estimate. So nobody even wanted it. Wow. But I, I want love, it. If I had 10 Gs laying around, too. I would buy it. If I was 
swimming in dough, I would that would be one of the things I would like to have. Ten G's. <laughs> ten G's. Ten, if you have ten G's <laughs> laying around, that's I mean, regardless, we're going to that museum. Yeah. So um no, I love that whole story though, because it was basically like not to be sexist or anything, but a man created a device that was <laughs> its goal was to show women their imperfections and yeah. women were just like, No. Like, fuck you we don't need that <laughs> so they really were good for them like, though shove it satan we don't want you yeah so and it's probably doesn't really work right I mean, and not not to impugn his work he did amazing work but that was just a throwaway device and it looked creepy as hell you know all those yeah. ama- like they had dimple makers and all these weird devices God. that of course we will cover in this podcast but they really but that one in particular i love because it's just so cumbersome and big and tortury looking yeah and on top of it it's not really doing a great thing it's showing women it how is. their faces are quote-unquote screwed up and it's how pretty to fix demeaning them. it's pretty demeaning demoralizing it, yeah. it's supposed to be like a makeup artist tool can you imagine as like going to <laughs> yeah. mac or something as makeup artist and just uh <laughs> hey let me stick this on your head we'll figure out if your nose is slightly that's the thing is it's so intricate in its measurement that even if you have a slight anything It'll yeah. show up on this device and you'll feel like, oh my God, I didn't even know that. Yeah, you know? I would be screwed. So it's shit. It's just, <laughs> yeah, we'd all, we'd all be screwed and we'd all have really poor self-esteem after using that, I think. So that um, That's made me cool. really sad, that story. Yeah, but now you know what my cover photo is. That was a good, um, that was a good first topic to cover, I think. I've, I've been wanting to talk about that for a long time. Well, because people ask me what that picture is. They just think it's like some weird picture I found. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Here's the story. I was like, is that like an optometry thing? Like what's happening? Yeah. 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 Uh, it's a confusing. But I'd never device. really thought to ask you because I just knew you were a little weird and strange and <laughs> cool. And I was like, it's, you know, just seemed normal. But it's strange and beautiful, is it not? It is. It's relating to the beauty industry, and it's strange as fuck. That's right. Yeah. But that's a lot of what... I mean, we've kind of gone over what we want to talk about. We have some topics that we want to cover in this podcast, but a lot of it is just going to be sort of historical and to do with beauty in some context. Just weird beauty trivia, yeah. vintage, whatever. Oh, go to our website. We'll talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. But... Just your friends having a chat. What um, else you got? Well, I've got one more thing, Anna. Do you want to know? I want to know. Do you really want to know? I really, really want to know. Um, <laughs> my next topic, Anna, is Theta Barra. Do you know who that is? I, I can't say that I readily know off the top of my head, but I'm sure this is going to be good. It's going to be so good. Um, yeah. She... Well, first of all, you'd have a huge crush on her. I don't know. Who, I mean, people still today, I'm sure do. So I, the reason I was thinking of her lately is because um, she's a beauty icon from the 20s okay. and even earlier, actually. Her career started in 1915, but I got Viv, my daughter Viv, um, a book at the library recently about a really fancy cat, <laughs> Oh. and it was about this cat that lived in a mansion, and there's one page in the book, I forgot what the book is called. But there's one page in the book where the fancy cat's watching TV with its fancy family, and it's all illustration, and then it just has Theta Barra on the TV, like an actual picture of her. And so Viv, my little two-year-old, was asking, who's that, mommy? Yeah. And I got to be like, it's Theta Barra. And then I was Googling pictures of her and showing her, so it reminded me of how cool this woman was. Um, So the picture in the book was from Cleopatra, which I think she's most widely known for, which was in... um, when was that 1918 i think something like that but her um oh 1917 sorry so she was basically known as the original vamp like she was kind of the first oh. like clara bow was kind of gothy and everybody well, back then they were like you know. the noir film mm-hmm. stars right i mean that was pretty vampy yeah well yeah but she she was like the ultra vamp she really? was the first sort of gothy girl I'm telling you, you'd love this girl. She's but amazing. why was she so goth in comparison? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I I just happen to know. Um, <laughs> well, so she she was really unusual, and the thing I love about her is she was a Jewish girl from Ohio, and the okay. studios made up crazy stories about her to make her into something she wasn't. Oh, okay. And I just think it's so interesting. So she's a Jewish girl from Ohio. 
She didn't get famous until she was 30 years old, which... Oh, wow. I've only really heard about, like, Mae West, I think, was 40 when she was discovered and had really? a big break and all that. Did you know that? Yeah. No. I believe she was But my grandmother looks like her. Yeah. Really? Yeah. All right. I need to see some grandmother photos. Put it on the blog. Share. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. We want to see yeah. that girl. Um, so, yeah. So, she... Which is... It's very unusual back then, you know? Especially, we just talked about the beauty calibrator and finding yeah. everything that's wrong with you. Well, being old, being 30 back then... Not cool. Not so cool. So she got famous as a sex symbol when she was 30. And mm-hmm. that was in 1915 in a movie called Siren of Hell. Whoa. And then that was... Uh, don't see you love her already. Yeah. And so from that point onward, it was such a big break that she was in 33 movies between 1915 and 1918. Can you wow. imagine being in that many movies? That's incredible. Counting on my fingers three or four years. I mean, she probably yeah. does worked all the time i mean she probably just worked her little tail off and it was a very cute tail (laughs) 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 very cute so she so yeah so jewish kid from ohio the studio said she was born in the shadows of the pyramids and trained in paris with sarah bernhardt do you know sarah bernhardt is a little bit she was she was really famous as well she was probably one of the most famous um early career entertainment ladies um I first heard about Sarah Bernhardt from, you know, I'm obsessed with Moulin Rouge, the movie. Uh Uh-huh. Have you seen it? Of course. Okay. There's a scene very quickly where Nicole Kidman is putting on her red corset. Uh Uh-huh. And what is she? She says something like, oh, I want to be like the great Sarah and looks back at a photo and it's of Sarah Bernhardt. Okay. And I was like, who, Sarah, what? And so I, I remember looking it up and finding out a lot of things about her there should be an episode about her she's wonderful but anywho they said that um theta barra trained with um sarah bernhardt to make her sound really cool Mm -hmm. that wasn't true so um they also said throughout her career she was egyptian middle eastern a french woman um (laughs) they said she was the daughter of an arab sheik and a french woman born in the sahara (laughs) she's jewish kid from ohio yeah it's, it's just cool so i like yeah. her story because it's That's so awesome. um uh like, fabricated and like it's so fabricated and they also said she had dabblings in the occult like they just really built oh up this yeah whole i image love that because yeah because she looked so exotic and she would also do the like heavy eye coal thing especially after she oh, yeah. appeared in cleopatra of course and so she got i guess over a thousand marriage proposals people named sandwiches perfumes after her oh, okay. um and named their children after her it was like she was big news and wow. no no one was like her she was so gorgeous so i, I just can't wait to look that up like i want to see a ton of pictures yeah she oh she also in 1930 they put that in yeah her so she had she was also known for being a little skanky looking really but like but but good like she wore pasties and stuff in films uh-huh. And can you imagine back in like 1915? Can't really do that. So yeah. she, in 1930, there was a production code and her costumes were banned. Oh. Because bosses tried to regulate her films from becoming too racy or too inappropriate for mass audiences. And that meant no pasties for Theta Barra. Go girl. Um, Go girl. I know. And she, I was trying to look up more about her because I guess her voice has only been recorded once or twice. Because she only did silent film. Huh. So her career ended in 1926, and she died, I think, in her 50s. And no talkies, just silent films. How no did talkies. she die? Um, stomach cancer. Oh. Mm-hmm. Which I didn't read too much about, because it just made me sad, because I just want her to live on forever yeah. <laughs> in my brain. But it did, yeah, it made me a little sad. But I yeah. love, I, I wanted to pick two stories kind of primarily yeah. about how, um, beauty is just shaped by someone's idea of beauty instead of what it actually is because people you know it's subjective it's such a subjective yeah it's the subjective and she's, thing and she's you know mm. one of the more controversial icons mm-hmm. of beauty i guess you could say i mean yeah no she was kind of the first i think she was the first on-screen person to make men and women say wow that's beautiful and i want and, that and, and it's, it's different not, and it's different, right? Yeah. It kind of yeah. opened people's minds to like, it's not just the norm of what you'd see on yeah. the screen. And yeah. they were actually receptive to it. 
That's so obviously awesome. the studios played that up, but it's still... I think that was a perfect selection. Well Thank done. Thank you. I just yeah. really like her, and I like talking about people I like. Maybe we'll do an episode about you. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're so lucky. I've known her for many years as a most charming and gracious lady, and I want you to meet her now, Miss Theta Barrett. Thank you, Woody. Our Hollywood entertainment has certainly developed amazingly since I was making pictures. Yes, yeah, so everything's different now. As you and I know, before our pictures grew up and started to talk, we had to translate all emotion into pantomime. Oh, you may think you have trouble today, but do you remember the difficulties we had working with a split screen? We had to express jealousy, hate, love, or devotion, all in pantomime, and at the same time keep pace as the director guided us with a one, two, three, four, just as a metronome guides a pianist. Is this where I start talking about my topics? If you want, if there's something you'd rather be doing, you can go do no, it. No, I want to tell, you know, I want to tell. You having fun? Having yes. Fun? Um, the first topic, I mean, I guess this is a topic that's close to me, um, considering <laughs> what I what I do. And I thought that this was appropriate um, for the first episode. we tell people episode. what you do? We did, right? Oh, we, we didn't tell people what I do. What do um, you do? I'm a perfumer. Um, and my company is called The Parlor Co. Um, and I make handmade Victorian inspired perfume. So I guess you can it's see really why Zoli Vera and The Parlor Co. are kind of hand in hand. But um, we just did a giveaway together, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not trying yeah. to pimp that because the giveaway is closed now. There's a winner. But yeah. But we do winner, stuff like I'm that. I'm shipping your stuff tomorrow, actually. Yeah. If you're listening, I just, I just dropped a cup. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> maybe she's well, listening. Maybe she's she great. Is. She's got good bangs. Yeah, I remember excellent. that about her winner. Yeah. Excellent bangs, winner. But um, yeah, your perfume is amazing. Go on, please. Oh, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna just jump in with a few facts about my topic because they're kind of strange and interesting. But I'm covering right. the history of perfume. Um, <gasps> yeah, and it, you know it's strange in that I'm gonna share some some interesting facts and tell you a little bit about the origins but um what do you well, like about making perfume are you one of those people that just has a perfume nose i do i really can actually to, okay. just design perfume by scent which is actually mm -hmm. um not something everyone can do but mm -hmm. um i kind of just go with my whim and you know it's you know it's all about trial and error but um oh my goodness You've got good instincts. Anna sent me a sample kit once, and yeah. it was one of the best days of my life. <laughs> it was just like yeah, 20 little vials, and they, so, were, they all had the best names. <laughs> yeah. One of them is named Harlot after we had a conversation about Harlots. Yeah. Sometimes I name <laughs> them after people, one. and I named yeah. one after Allison. Um. Yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. That mm -hmm, was... Mm -hmm. But um, the <laughs> beginnings of perfume kind of is strange. Um, I, th I find this to be really interesting. Um, now, I don't know if I'm going to say this correctly or not, but ambergris um, mm -hmm. is one of the most valuable raw material materials in perfume. Um, and its scent is described as something that's sort of oceany, sweet, um, and it can add a lot of depth to a fragrance but mm. the funny thing about this is that it's produced in the intestines of sperm whales <laughs> i am so glad you're taking this approach because so many yeah. people don't understand where perfume comes from yeah and what those um, smells are and the pheromones yeah. and all that stuff yeah. yes go um, on i'm so excited so it's basically like whale vomit <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and like Today, we don't really use the um, original, you know, versions of these scents. Um, they're like been synthetically reproduced. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the beginnings of perfume actually like I don't even know like to think like how they even like procured like whale vomit. But I mean, I guess if they were like harpooning whales, they were digging into their stomachs or something. But um, that is like who thought to do that. Who went? That's going to smell great. Yeah. <laughs> let's bottle that yeah um that's interesting and you know something similarly to that though is in a lot of beauty products they'll use like the secretions of uh gosh what is it i want to say it's it's some sort of like 
marsupial and they like use its like anal gland secretions for for not only scent but for mm-hmm. flavor like in vanilla extract yeah. um mm-hmm. yeah have you heard that one before oh gosh it's there's a name for it um, they have i mean even in mascara there's yeah bat bat secretion yeah. components and yeah. so people often think that um organic is better but sometimes when you buy organic that's what it means yeah because it's not synthetic stuff it's it's from nature so just think about that guys yeah. 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 Um, no, it's and, and in perfume I've heard that for a very long time that it's um because because humans are innately attracted to those smells, to pheromones yeah. and to smells that aren't necessarily pleasant. You kinda of have an undertone. And that actually leads me into this into other it. part that's really kind of gross. But um <laughs> so as you've a lot of you have probably heard like you've heard like musk in fragrance. Um mm-hmm. but and it's pretty like a potent um a a potent scent and um it actually is a reddish brown substance secreted by male musk deer (laughs) not so weird yeah it reminds Um, me of dogs sniffing each other's butts like totally they they like it yeah just let them do it and but since it like today you would have to like kill an endangered animal it's not really used in perfume today but um again they like try to mimic these versions and they do it synthetically um Mm -hmm. so you know um, so what you're saying is all perfumers are like kind of crazy a little bit no i (laughs) mean they're into i personally don't have any perfumes in my line that like use these scents um but i just think it's like fascinating that at like one time like i I kind of like wish that we could go back and like smell these perfumes and you know know. um Mm -hmm. and the original makers i don't know if any of you already know this but the egyptians are some of the first to have ever created perfume um Mm. i actually i went to the titanic exhibit and there was um there was a perfumer whose little portfolio suitcase was there it was found at the bottom of the ocean in the wreckage and i think there were three or four vials over 100 years old and it said that when the divers found it and opened it up you could still smell it Oh, Amazing. that is so cool. <laughs> I know. And I didn't know you when I saw it. You know, I would have yeah. called you immediately. But it's pretty morbid, some of the, the yeah. origins. But but it is nice that they're kind of synthetically mimicking that because you don't want to be going after endangered animals or animals at all. We both no. have cruelty-free yeah. companies, so it's not something we Yeah, so I mean, in. I guess me sharing this information isn't necessarily like <laughs> <laughs> saying like, hey, this is cool, but... <laughs> um <laughs> but it's in, but it's part of how something was made and it's really interesting to think that people went for those ideas and they became popular yeah and then throughout that process people had no idea what they were smelling <laughs> yeah there was Ooh, this how lovely um, there was this number it's yeah the origin of perfume goes back to the egyptians um and they archaeologists have uncovered a perfume factory which dates to 2000 bc um mm. And I thought this was interesting because I'm always fascinated in finding out like what were some of the most popular scents that were used in perfume um, back then um, and if they're similar now or not. And like, you know, culturally, did people want to smell the same then as they do now? But I I actually don't think so. Um, Mm -hmm. Some of the some there's like some um, essences that are like tried and true, like um, they found in this perfume factory, lavender and um like rosemary and like you'll find that in in perfume today but then they found things like coriander laurel myrtle um yeah and basically uh so the egyptians started it but then the persians they they use it as a form of political status um then the greeks and romans took over perfume for their use as a form of art um and then started producing it in mass and to actually like people started actually using it commercially um but then it wasn't until 1190 that perfume began to be produced commercially in paris and paris is really where perfume just took off and it became like a massive industry um from there but yeah i think that's the only thing i knew about the origins is that Paris is very synonymous with perfume yeah. and the, the popularization of perfume. Yeah. Or little perfumeries where you would go and make your own, you know, 
you could go on. Well, same with cosmetics. They would make yeah. you on cosmetics and clothing too. Before places like um, uh, blah blah, I can't remember his name, but <laughs> the man who basically invented retail as we know it today, Selfridge. Thank you. Oh, yes. places like Selfridges where that was you know instead of having um, clothing that was. Um, yeah you know like haute couture type things of today they would have ready to wear already made stuff on the shelves i think in paris it was the same thing yes was, exactly that was where perfume, i mean perfumers in paris originally were kind of like i mean yeah you would go in and they would design it specifically for you and it was pretty much mm-hmm. used by you know royalty or the rich or um and a lot of times it was custom made. Um, it wasn't till later that it was really like commercially produced. Um, but what's cool is that perfume and the uses of perfume kind of leads me into um, my next topic. Um, well, please and- continue. I'm curious. We don't tell each other what our topics are, by the way. So yeah, I'm surprised. And I I'm like wondering if so I, much. if I should if I should share just a little bit before I before I go on, but um, I want it from no. your heart. You tell me what no. you're feeling. I was gonna tell you guys a little bit about like the different types of perfumes, um, because a lot of people just think like, I mean, a lot of people know this, but a lot of people don't know that there's like actual different concentrations of perfumes, and depending on the concentration, is kind of the format of the perfume and its strength um right like a um an eau toilette or something yes yeah yeah which i see that only has i don't know if many people know this but it's only like 15 percent concentration so you Mm -hmm. take you know 15 percent um pure fragrance and mix it into you know ethanol or water or a combination of both um but it's Et de parfum, which has like a, a composition of up to forty percent, um, and that's where you're going to get your your most potent um, your most potent fragrances that will last the longest. But you know, today they're they're kind of produced um, in a more complicated method, whereas mm-hmm. like um, with more like handmade perfumers you're going to get some pretty simplistic blends and more natural ways of making it um a lot of perfumers will use only um natural plant essences um which is great um i think that's great but to get more complex um fragrances sometimes you need to use thin synthetics and mm-hmm. some people you know have their opinions about using synthetics on their skin and everyone one is entitled to that um but you'll get a little bit more complexity um in a fragrance if you yeah on you know. that note too i mean fragrance oils are well anything that either you or i would use or i mean that any sane person would use would be skin safe so oh yeah even when you're using something synthetic it's at such a low concentration yeah like yeah. you think of it as using a low concentration and then putting say a drop of it on your skin yeah um same with skincare products like if i use anything synthetic especially preservatives you know because in yeah. skincare products you have to use preservatives you use such a small percentage so it's skin safe to begin with but the concentration you're using is so minimal it's kind of like having arsenic and apple juice you know right it naturally occurs yeah. in apple juice but it's not enough to kill you it's not you yeah. know it's not going to be harmful at all <laughs> so i do hear a lot of I, well i've heard a lot there's a lot of flack about natural perfumes and how they suck and yeah, because it's hard to make something all natural, especially scent wise. That's good, and that appeals to a lot of people. So not a lot of people well, do it. The pure plant essences. There's a very limited number that are actual pure plant that you can derive a pure plant essence. Those are things like orange mm. and lemon and um, rosemary and ab- rose absolute, lavender. I mean, there mm. is a handful of of essences that you can use. Um, but I mean, you do the math. If there are tons of natural perfumers out there creating, you're probably gonna a lot of you are gonna have the same, um, mm. you know, formulas. And you'll right. find you'll find this, you know, really not very unique smelling perfume. Not I'm not saying that I don't love just like a pretty basic like lavender vanilla. You know, mm-hmm. like that's great and everything. But um, you know, I enjoy as a perfumer really like designing more complex fragrance and Mm. 
with that you kind of need like a whole what what we would call in the perfume world like an organ there's like a perfume organ there's an actual literal like you have like a whole like um wall of your plant of your fragrant essences and they're all like bottled and so like um you can even look that up there's they're called like a perfume organ and it's like basically any perfumer's like just wet dream (laughs) um and i actually have one I didn't have a wet dream, but I have a perfume organ. Uh, and, well, let's um, put that on the blog and also in my face because I would like to see it. Um. <laughs> so if you like imagine a piano and you imagine or like an organ and you like just have rows of essences and like, yeah, it's pretty awesome. But um, I have to stop you real quick and tell you that um, I tried to make you watch the movie Perfume. Oh, which is I did watch on, it, but I just didn't get the to the Susky end because I fell asleep. Well, the end is the best part. But I, um, I believe there's a scene, or there's several scenes in his workshop. Dustin Hoffman plays the perfumist. Perfumer? Yeah. Perfume- is perfumist a thing? So it's a th- Can you just say that or yeah. no? I've heard of it, but I don't have a problem with that. No. I like perfumer. I'm going to do that. Yeah. He's a perfumer, and he was an expert one in this, in this story. And he, I believe, had the perfume organ, as you call it, in his workshop. His workshop was amazing. It was like just this amazing apothecary with, yeah. but a lot of it was just the the notes of perfume. I don't know what yes. you call that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, like the undertones and the top notes. I don't know what the terminology. Well, but. yeah, there's there's usually a base, a middle, and a top. Um, yes. I mean, you could have ten different like mm-hmm. essences in a fragrance, but commonly you'll see like a the base notes the middle notes and the top notes the base mm-hmm. notes are something that is like the usually the highest concentration of your fragrance mm-hmm. um and it's something that lasts the longest it's something that once the perfume starts to burn off or like fade away you'll still get some of the the base notes and usually people mm-hmm. use things like um like more woody or earthy or even like rich um like gourmands as their mm. as their bases um so like amber and cedar and sandalwood and even vanilla can be used as a base um but then you'll get into your um your middle notes which is kind of something that has like some bo- add some body to a fragrance and it typically lasts like pretty long within the fragrance um definitely longer than the top notes yeah and and so making we would call that an anchor a, a yeah. scent anchor like there the base go. note would be an anchor scent and then you would add something else on top of it because because it yeah. fades differently as it cures yeah um, exactly but that's some, that's so interesting to learn because people don't really understand the difference between a lot of people don't understand between cheap perfume and expensive perfume and that's yeah. one of the things in life that I urge you to splurge on because there really is such a difference just in quality how it's made the ingredients but just the way it works with your skin chemistry is so different yeah Um, that's a big thing it's gonna smell kind of different on someone else it does i think people like are surprised sometimes when they smell you know like a handmade perfume versus a commercially Mm -hmm. produced perfume um because they don't smell always smell the same not to mention that like you know Ma- you know mass produced commercially made perfume is like they're all copying each other and they're going with trend mm-hmm. and they're going off of um i don't know just they're not really trying to be necessarily super unique they're trying to appeal to a mass audience um, right they're so, trying to fall within their brand guidelines yeah and, you yeah know, that like they can acts find or the, something you know, you know it's exactly be what a teenage yeah. boy would want or, you know so you'll find a lot stranger perfume if you go with oh, something handmade see what you did there <laughs> yeah and loop ending <laughs> full circle um no that's really i actually kind of forgot how interesting perfume is and yeah. honestly watching the movie perfume which is again based on the Suskin novel so fucking good um it's all about i thought it would be a super girly movie because it's called perfume but it's about exactly oh, it what was, you're talking about yeah it's yeah. about the base notes and the middle notes and the top notes and then it's also about how you would source those ingredients yeah um and the idea is well in the movie at least is kind of like the pheromone level what you're talking about where he um this aspiring perfumer would yeah. find beautiful girls and try to capture their scent and make the ultimate Ugh, perfume so creepy by but using their scent yeah. <laughs> and it well yeah you don't i don't think that's how you make perfume but i don't know 
I don't know what you do. That's not what you do. <laughs> That's my <laughs> my trade secret. <laughs> Just a little little secret ingredient. You gotta put that in a the safe like Coca Cola. Yeah. This leads me into my next topic, um, which I'll get in more depth, but I first just want to say the reason why that it correlates is because um, it's about Victorian mourning etiquette and oh, photography and, and jewelry. Um, you guys, this is why she's my best friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, so why why is this perfume relating to that? But there's just one little snippet about that. But... Um, I guess I guess this is sort of relating and unrelating, but like Victorian jewelry, I'm always fascinated by. And um, mm-hmm. there was a particular kind of, um, uh, I guess, jewelry piece that was made that was called a nosegay, and it actually was like a little like kind of um, filigree locket that would contain like um, a little little like piece of fabric that had. Um, perfume basically on it and you would wear it around your neck yeah you You would wear it around your neck and like as you guys might know there was a lot of um issues with hygiene in the victorian era there was a lot of really (laughs) yeah issues with bathing (laughs) issues with Mm -hmm. um death um is a is a Mm -hmm. very big theme in victorian era um history and you know people were attending um burials a lot and you know a nosegay not only would like be something that could cover up the scent of something um not smelling so great but um it could also be said to like uplift the spirits so you know if you were mourning the death of a loved one it was something that you could you know maybe even um commemorate them through so if it was like a a, you put some of their perfume on on the necklace or um, or cologne or you could um yeah i just thought that was really interesting i Um, never knew i know a lot of things about the victorian era i didn't know that that's really that's touching it kind of reminds me of putting you know hair in a locket yes which is another thing they would have done you know you would have commemorate somebody by putting you know a picture in a locket or even a a bit of hair um teeth was common which is kind of creepy Mm -hmm. um and there were also things called lacrimosas or tear catchers i know about those yeah yeah and you know there's rumor that they were actually used to catch the tears of the morning but um there's debate of whether that people actually use them for that and that they were more just like fancy perfume bottle necklaces Mm -hmm. but um you know you make those now don't you um yeah or you did i mean i yeah they contain perfume inside of them so technically you couldn't call them a lacrimosa unless you're gonna put your tears in there but i'll put my tears in there we can sell it (laughs) If you want to get technical, I first heard of Lacrimosa because there's um, a Regina Spector song called Lacrimosa, but I didn't oh. really know what it was until you you were like, "Hey, look at this thing I'm making. Like, What's that?" And you told me, and it all yeah. clicked. Yeah, because of course you would know that. Yeah. So I'm just always been like fascinated by Vic- every anything Victorian morning. Um, you know, the Victorians mm-hmm. were known for their elaborate commemorations there are elaborate gravestones i mean that's why Mm -hmm. you see some of the you know all the cemeteries that we like know and love probably have a lot to owe to the victorian era another thing that i've always i've always thought was just like fascinating and i don't know i'm i already know you know about this but um was victorian morning photography and post-mortem photography one of Um, my most favorite well not favorite but most fascinating it's one of my I've ever come across. favorite it, yeah. it is one of my favorite i think that mm-hmm. it's actually pretty beautiful and like it'd be so taboo today but mm. you know i think that's what it is it's it's, it's shocking to, it's to shocking see and when you first that see these way, images you're you know? like it's almost like you want to be offended or insulted yeah. but you know to the victorians it was like you know a lot of people couldn't afford to have their picture picture taken Mm-hmm. in their when they were living you know so a lot of times like the only picture that would have been um available to a family member to a mother to a father especially because there were so many children dying in the victorian era i mean they could mm-hmm. only afford to have their picture taken at death and mm-hmm. like you know it's incredibly sad but you know 
can you imagine i don't know could you imagine us doing that today i don't know i guess we don't need to because we take selfies constantly i mean we have everything documented right. people <laughs> but, are taking selfies with people in caskets too which is yeah crazy. <laughs> oh, God. oh my how things yeah. have changed but yeah. it really i think what creeps me out the most about postmortem photography is that to this day it's difficult to tell if it if yes. they're postmortem or not you have to yeah. look for certain signs I don't mean to steal your story. Maybe no, you're I want you. There. Yeah, but please elaborate. But there, um, there are certain signs you have to look for, like um, someone could look because they would pose these people. They would have you know metal rods to lift their heads up and yeah. and you know do certain things to make them look alive. And you're holding hands with your spouse and yeah. just normal yeah. day, and they would pop their eyes open and stuff. So you would have to look for um, like hands that looked like they were mangled a little bit. I know that that's yeah. one of the telltale signs. Yeah. Um, or like like color i mean it's black and white but to see the coloring difference the gradient of the gray on the hands being a little bit different or just sort of a claw shaped you know hand um so that was something that so there's still images i come across on ebay all the time which i'm sure you do the same thing where you rifle through ebay for postmodern photography because we're best friends um and i do that too and and people will sell these and they don't know if if it's postmortem or not, and you really have to, so you're looking at a picture of a cute little baby, and then you're yeah. like, wait a minute, and it's the and and that's the feeling that to me is a little gut wrenching and strange. Um, and there's also um, one of a retailer for Zulia Vera is called Victoria Mansion in Portland, Maine, and they, um, I don't know if they do this every year, and it sold out so quickly because so many people are fascinated by this. Um, they're a Victorian era mansion, but they just did an exhibit think over a weekend of um postmortem photography which i thought was amazing because it's you know a mainstream place open to the public showing postmortem photography yeah in a beautiful and I, way i mean i think if you if you're into the victorian era i mean death kind of goes hand in hand mm-hmm. um with that era just because of so much like epidemic disease war i mean like there's a lot of loss of life and you mm-hmm. know because there was so much loss of life i mean it was a huge lucrative industry you know right casket makers undertakers um you name it um cl- clothiers of mourning attire which i mean people mourning during the victorian era i mean they were dressed in all black head to toe for weeks at a time yeah like you know it was I like i love we, that tradition so much when yeah. you're in mourning and you wear black for a time yeah period. and i wondered too if do you know about um like Queen Victoria, I know that the reason people traditionally wear white wedding dresses, I believe it's because she wore a white wedding yeah. dress when nobody else really did, so she kind of started that trend. But I know that she was in mourning for a long period a long, of her life. Yes. So I always wonder, I've never looked into it, and maybe you know, but I always wondered if her white dress sort of was the authority and, and um, made it popular for brides to wear white if when she went into mourning for a long period of time, if everybody else kind of I fell believe into the so. Pattern. I believe there's, there's some correlation between that. I think um, so. Yeah. I've always I can't remember. I, I believe she had a few children die throughout her life. I'm pretty sure. And she also had, you know, the hu- her husband die or right. is that what, you know, so. Her, I believe her husband died and she had some sort of suitor. Or it was, yeah. Or it, what? Maybe it was the suitor, the oh, I can't even think of the name. The opposite of a mistress, a male mistress. <laughs> and I'm just looking at this <laughs> fact here. When I said that people were wearing full mourning attire for weeks, it was actually expected for two years. What? I didn't yeah, know two that years. Long. Yeah. Okay, um, guys, that's a little. That's yeah. a little too sad. That's too long. What do you think? Yeah. I don't know if like. Do you think that the the Victorians like? just really got off on that or like (laughs) i think it was a big sign of respect of like yes this is it was very set it's just something so romantic about it at the same time i know i I really i love traditions we folks will certainly go into my love for the history of the british monarchy but so much of why i love that is the tradition and I mean, everything just is so symbolic and it's just, this is what you do and this is the way you do it yeah. and this is why. And if you want to show respect and be part of this, then you do it too. But if there's yeah. just something so beautiful in community about that. Of yeah. you see something and you immediately know she's wearing black, that's what this means. And you yeah. immediately just know I mean, it how almost, to interact. Yeah, like the sense of community around it yeah. where, I mean, I would guess that, 
you, I don't know, get some sort of support or respect yeah. or, you know. It was um, just nice. Or like you take your hats off when you go inside. Sign of respect. Like another just- fact about death during the Victorian era, um, you know, the Victorians tended to have a lot of children because it was common for a lot of children to not even live till the f- their fifth birthday. <sighs> Can you imagine? imagine? (laughs) It's really, what a sad time. It was just a really sad time. And it's so strange how we have those, those little errors in our history where just that brief period of time was so fucking sad. And then the twenties, Ooh, so much fun, but it's like right afterwards. And it's just, you have these visuals of what these errors were like. And the Victorians stood out so much for that reason. It was just, it was a hard time. Yeah. It was a hard time. But it's the the morning customs they had. I just think were so fascinating because they didn't really exist before or after it. You know? I mean, and they just really signify like the whole time period of like everything was so elaborate and everything was so ornate and nothing was really left <laughs> to be simplified. Like even just in design, mm-hmm. from houses to attire to jewelry. I mean, everything was just like so grand and so much mm-hmm. detail put into everything. Um, I would still love to own a Victorian house so much, even if it's falling apart. Fix it. Oh right yeah, up. I mean, I would say that would be even better. <laughs> yeah, no, I really there's um, there's quite a few stores here that have old doorknobs and glass panels and just bits and bobs from Victorian homes, and it's like, oh god, I just want to go in there and breathe it in. <laughs> it's just yeah. Do you ever do that? Do you go to antique stores and you're just oh, it just feels so good in here. Yeah, it does. I felt right at home. Yeah, I used to get really, um, whenever I'd go to antique stores, I would get nostalgic to a point where I'd almost get a little depressed. Yeah. Like, I'd just be so in love with what I was seeing and be like, You just, like, wish that you lived amongst the time period in which they were actually, like, being Mm -hmm. used commonly. Like, it's just kind of, like, sad. You're like, oh, my God. Like, I was born in the wrong era. It's overwhelming to to have such a connection to the past and to be surrounded by those things and see them just not being taken care of, sold for really cheap, and just so much. And even a Victorian house, it's the same thing where you put your life and your soul and all your money into it and no one would even really appreciate it or or want it afterwards. I think think there's like a resurgence of people who appreciate those things now, but like there's definitely a time period where like... (laughs) I mean, it's probably still happening, but like neighborhoods were just being like completely demolished full of Victorians Mm -hmm. because they're making way for new developments. (laughs) My heart dropped. Right. It's true. Don't you get so sad when things are just bulldozed over? Yeah. They're one of my all time favorite places, which isn't Victorian. It's more Edwardian, but whatever. Um, The Elms Mansion in Newport, Rhode Island, which I think a lot of people know what I'm talking about. It's very famous. There's the Breakers, probably the most famous. We'll do an episode about it because it's one of my favorites. Um, but the Elms is very close by, I believe on Bellevue Ave. And um, that, what it had a scheduled date for a wrecking ball. And it's one oh. of my all-time favorite places. Um, the Berwins lived there. They didn't have children. They were just there alone. Um, but so all the furniture in there is not the original furniture because they basically just, they were actually able to, once the wrecking ball was stopped, they were able to buy back some pieces from people that had bought it or they donated it back. Yeah, you know, because they knew it would be a museum. Um, but it's like going into that place. I think of it every time. Like that's you know, like my um, my Elizabeth Wharton Drexel painting with she's got kind of an orange yeah. dress. Yeah, that is a replica of. Um, it's in the oh, ballroom of the Elms. Amazing. So it's like all these amazing things. Like, and I just the the stories when you walk through this place. It's just they grip me so much. And some people would think it's the most boring thing in the world. I but love it's it. Like, I feel and it could like have been gone it, 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 throughout history. Like there's been such an importance placed on tradition and oral tradition and and preserving history. And like I, it just baffles me that anybody would think. I mean, I guess that's why we have historically designated, you know, buildings and properties, and you're not allowed to touch them. But like, God, I think that's why we have sto- historically inspired companies too. Yeah, because we're both just so in love with that time period and the way that things were done and it's really hard to look around and see absolutely nothing that resembles it nowadays yeah and you just want to build that world back up and and that's why i love maybe you do too because 
with perfume, it kind of reminded me of old recipes. Yes. I love finding old recipes because you can make it. The, I mean, obviously, it's going to taste different. Yeah. But you can make the same thing that was made I mean, made I, I haven't been able to, to procure any male deer musk or um, whale no. vomit, but I mean... It, mm-hmm. <laughs> you have a cat behind you that I'm sure vomits sometimes. I won't touch so try cat. to substitute. No. <laughs> no, we, we like to stay cruelty-free. Yeah. Because, I mean... That's actually really important to me. Yeah. But it's with that being said, it is so interesting the origins of some of these things and just how it all comes about. But the Victorian era in particular. If you love the Victorian area area era, <laughs> you should be our friend because we appreciate you. But some people just don't care. It means so much to me. I know it does. I know. That's how I feel about it. Like oh, that's my life. Yeah. But yeah. That's my whole life. That was interesting as hell. Is that all you wanted to say about that? I don't want to cut you oh, off. Oh, I think that's about it. I mean, okay. I'm, I could go on for days, but that... We like our stories. We hope you like our stories. Yeah. If you have ideas for stories, for stories. you should oh, tell us. Oh, please email right? any story ideas to, to beautiful strange podcast at gmail. Yeah, yeah, I forgot what our email was. Beautiful so strange podcast. You yeah. You can also follow us on Instagram at beautiful strange podcast wouldn't you like to do that yeah yeah i bet you would yeah but we'll be sharing you know the photos and the videos and all the stuff we talk about because i don't know i really like this stuff and i want to find all the resources i can to give me information on it so we'll be talking about some interesting stuff and if you are an enthusiast and you want to be on our podcast hit us up (sighs) yes yeah if you Be have friend. if you have something topic or brand we'd love to hear from you even if you have you know what even if you have a story like some yes. sort of story like my grandmother yada yeah. yada in the yada yadas with the yada yada we want to hear about your grandmother yeah email us about your grandmother if she's really pretty or if she's not just send us a picture we want to see her yeah we just like old things but you should really if you have a story we could read it right yeah we could read your story. Yeah. That would be nice. Anything just like stories. strange, beautiful mm-hmm. and strange, historical, creepy, paranormal. Paranormal, yes. Oh, we both love paranormal things. Yeah. We were just talking about psychics. Yeah. That was fun. Yeah. I think Anna has some strange little witchy power, though. A I little do. bit. It's just she's, like a little... She's a little, right about everything. A little dash. It's a little dash of witch. It's a dash, but it's always... But it's prevalent, and it, it always... It seems crazy at the time, and then all of a sudden, I'm like, God damn it. Yeah. She knew exactly what she was talking about. Ye- You're like a godmother. That's kind of true. Can I be Viv's godmama? <laughs> oh, you know what? I don't think she has one. Am I, at this point in my life, entitled to, t- <laughs> Give that away. to be able to make that decision? Um, yeah. You can be half of Viv's yeah. godmother. <laughs> I go half seats. <laughs> You can go have these on Viv's I'm her psychic. I'm her psychic and intuitive. You're her fairy um, guide. psychic godmother. Yeah. I'll mm-hmm. just I'll mother <laughs> her from three thousand miles away with my psychic intuition, and I'll just like you'll be her put legal it out there. spirit guide. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anna got new teacups by the way, and they're gorgeous. Mm. And she's drinking out of one. Yeah. And I just have a Snapple. I don't feel as cool. Yeah. But we ooh wait, can we tell our dish story really quickly? Yes. Because it kind of yeah. So um, Anna was asking me to help her pick out new dishes. And I just did some random Googling because she knows I like her style and I see eye to eye with her. And so I Googled some dishes just randomly and found her some. And she said, these are the ones I already have. Yeah. That's weird. And then so I Googled some more dishes and said, what about these? And didn't you say like, that's the one I was just. And I said, oh, and it has 42 pieces. And she went, I was just looking at that and telling my husband, oh, my God, it has 42 (laughs) pieces. (laughs) Motherfuckers. So there's gonna be just, a lot of swearing so in this podcast have, that's why i just had to like i know we can't censor ourselves you guys yeah we're very professional people you kind of just like led me into a, a little tiny bit of a topic that i want you to talk about before we go because i think it's relevant for okay. episode number one and i want you to tell everybody about folia do and why that's relevant okay. to us like why okay so Allison and I like always like to joke that we are twins and we complete mm-hmm. each other's sentences. We pick out the same dishes. Um, it's just like we really do eerie. weird stuff. We have 
we have eerie similarities and we can do. you just tell me and remind everybody like what folia do means so okay. a folia do is basically when there's like a psychosis in one woman and then it turns about a psychosis in a secondary woman <laughs> yeah so they're kind of like twin souls or they basically say i became absolutely insane over a particular thing from talking to you you would grow yeah. insane it's kind of like stigmata thing. right like but like psychological yeah, stigmata would, right yeah. like sort of influencing each other without even realizing it yeah. and then suddenly you've you've both got a case of the whatever i just thought that was something that i had to bring up because yeah. i wanted it to be mm -hmm. uh, documented in episode number one and i'm sure everybody has like somebody in the world that they share that with so yeah you know but does everybody in the world have a girl that would make a folly do perfume for Christmas for them? Yeah. No. Yeah. That's I'd... mine. There's one vial and it belongs to me. <laughs> yeah. But maybe in the future. It do, it do you remember what you put in it? It I, was violet, right? I do. It has violet and white tea and mm -hmm. amber. Which is a lotion that I make. Yeah. Violet, violet white, tea, and white tea, amber. I want to say it has like peony it in it and a little bit of vanilla. It's kind of like, um, I really tried to go with like a vintage floral scent, but Allison doesn't like floral, but I was like, I'm going to do it anyways. So No, you did it. You got me with that. Yeah. Because I was into violet lately anyway. Yeah. But that worked out. And you have, um, which we just did in our giveaway, a Victorian spirit perfume. Yeah. And I still wear that almost every day, which has vanilla in it, yeah. which I'm not. Yeah. Anytime I think vanilla, I think of like Bath and Body Works. Like baby you know? prostitutes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, baby prostitute. And I yeah. don't want to smell like that. Yeah. But that, I don't know. There's something about what... It's more of a gourmand scent. It, but like, gourmand so is more of like a sweet, kind of like pastry, mm. yummy, creamy, caramelized. Okay. It's the creaminess, yeah. Yeah, it's more right. like a creamy okay. vanilla with like a with like a woody base it's actually called victorian spirit mm. and then it's like woodland mm. sweet cream so it's like woodland sweet cream yeah. i love that yeah no i didn't know how to describe it because it really is like i smelled it and was like this doesn't smell like a sweet baby prostitute no this actually it's, it's more great. like a sophisticated hooker that's so every day folks if you run into me i'm gonna smell like a real sophisticated. which just hooker. led me to a topic that we're gonna cover soiled doves I don't know if you know what soiled doves are. I'm sorry. Are. Soiled doves? No. Yeah. No, I'm not going to tell you mm -hmm. about it yet, but we're going to cover that. Yeah, don't tell anybody. We're going to cover we're that cover next it. time. Next time? Speaking of prostitution next in the time. Victorian oh, era. The Strange Beautiful Podcast. Yeah. The, be uh, the Beautiful Strange Podcast. <laughs> I said it wrong. Allison's got her <laughs> podcast voice on. So can you do our outro for us? Well, first I want to say we both vowed not to have a podcast voice. I said, what am I going to turn record on and... We're just going to have a podcast voice. I don't think so. No, but what about your Liza Minnelli people? voice? I've been in a Liza Minnelli mood today. I've been in kind of a show tunes mood today. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. I listen to a lot of Beyonce. I cut my bangs yes. a little shorter. I put a lot of eye makeup on. I ate some chocolate she cereal. She looks good, guys and girls. She's looking good today. Yeah. Today. I'm about to go wash it all off, so. And I'm over here with a cold and a hoodie and Yeah. You know, some you're also looking good some today. days you're an Allison and some days you're an Anna and it's okay either way. <laughs> you just, you just got to pick your poison. So, you know, the next time we record, I think that Allison might be wearing pajamas. I usually am. I like to call it loungewear, Anna. Yeah. Um, I've recently come to find out that people call um, pajamas that don't look like pajamas loungewear, but they still feel like you know pajamas. What? There's so. another name for that and it's called active wear active yeah but that's more like the shiny material yeah like like i don't know lycra and spandex yeah but you're right yeah yeah so you don't like the spandex too much but you can get loungewear to me just means pajamas that are like a black yeah solid print yeah you know like you could leave the house with them and people would be like is that a pajama like some jeggings you know like, is that are those pants or is that they're leggings the pajamas yeah i wear leggings more times than not yeah. i'm i wear and jeans all the time I, well, you're a California girl, yeah. and it's always warm. But I have to get creative because in Maine it gets very cold, and sometimes I'll wear long skirts with pajama pants underneath. But you can get away with that because if you wear tall boots, you can't see the pajama. Yeah, pants. yeah. Actually, I went to a makeup job like that once, and I had 
I had. Well, you couldn't tell, but then the model saw, which she's actually a friend of mine now, yeah. and she's really, really fucking cool. So yeah. if she's listening, that's Heather. Um, but she, I, I went to do her makeup, and I just looked totally normal and professional, and then I sat down and crossed my legs. She was like, are you wearing red plaid pajama pants under your skirt? <laughs> Yes, I am. <laughs> and now we're friends, and yeah. it's okay. That was like 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, that's my story. Yeah. So, next time on the Beautiful Strange Podcast, Thanks, we'll be talking about <laughs> whale sperm. What did you say? I, I, I think I'm going to talk about soiled doves, which soil you'll doves. find out. What am I going to talk about? I can't tell you. I don't know. To be determined. Yeah, to be determined. I hope you liked our topics, yeah. everybody. I hope it and again, made you want to come listen again. You. And I'm sorry for all the f bombs, but I'm not. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Yeah. No, it's just we're just gonna be who we are. We can't. I mean, yeah. we actually recorded and tried to. <laughs> yeah. Be really professional, and we laughed so hard we started crying. <laughs> we we did. actually did, and then we said we can't do this. We just have to be. I, we almost said like threw in the towel. We almost were like this isn't gonna work. Not gonna yeah. happen. But then I had to put my fa- my game face on, and I was like, we're going to do this. Yeah. yeah. We're just going to jump right in and talk to each other. So the good news is, even if you don't stick around, we're probably still going to do this. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's just It's not like we're us. getting paid for this. <laughs> no. This is just free fun time. Yeah. I should be asleep right now. Oh, my gosh. What oh, time is it your time? It's almost it's it's, after 10. It's 10 p.m. my time. Yeah. It's dinner it's time nice here in california well you should go eat dinner yeah i yeah the time difference is kind of a kicker but it, it doesn't matter too much i just you know we did it we have little girls though so we have to work around when they're going to be quiet in our house yeah and mine i heard she <laughs> just got good. home so oh yeah. there you go yeah she's a sweet gal she's so cute yeah. she looks like anna but a tiny anna it's very yeah it's, it's weird almost it is, she's a mini me she's a mini you she's great um so next time next we'll be time. talking about things that you can't know about until yeah. next time. Next time. So you got to come listen. Next time. Oh, we need an outro song. Yeah. We're going to insert that here. Boom. Now gather round while I lose a date on what goes on when it gets late. Along about midnight, the ghosts and banshees get together for a jamboree. There's ghosts with horns and saucer eyes. Some have fangs about this size. Some short and fat, some tall and thin. And some don't even bother to wear.